Most depictions of Mary Magdalene in popular culture characterize her in the same way, as a sex worker. In the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, for example, Mary is critiqued by Judas for her profession, and later describes how she's had quote-unquote, so many men. Indeed, most people, when asked to describe Mary Magdalene, would probably say she was a sex worker, one who became a symbol of forgiveness and redemption through her relationship with Jesus. However, the Bible doesn't depict Mary Magdalene that way at all. At no point do any of the Gospels of Mark, Luke, Matthew, or John suggest that she was a sex worker. In fact, she's described in the Gospels as one of Jesus' most loyal followers. Unlike many of the male apostles, Mary Magdalene stays with Jesus during his crucifixion. She's also the first person to notice his resurrection, because she was the only one sitting outside his tomb. Throughout the Bible, there is no clear link between Mary Magdalene and sex work. So how did she come to be thought of as a sex worker? The answer is a complicated one that has to do with the evolution of gender roles since biblical times, the Catholic Church, and especially Pope Gregory I. In 591, the Pope gave a sermon that would forever alter the world's perception of Mary Magdalene by describing her as a sinful woman. The Pope hadn't decided to slander Mary out of nowhere. Religious scholars at the time had increasingly found a connection between stories of Mary Magdalene in the Bible and other women described in the Gospels. The Pope agreed that these stories all referred to the same woman, and since some of these women were sinful women with bad names, he determined that Mary Magdalene was, too. By then describing her as sinful in 591, he heavily suggested that she was a sex worker. But his conclusion hasn't stood the test of time. So who was Mary Magdalene? Today, we'll be discussing how she was depicted in the Bible and why Pope Gregory I and the Catholic Church decided she should be described as a sinful woman. We'll also dive into what the Gospel of Mary, which was not discovered until 1896 and is not recognized by the Catholic Church today, says about her relationship with Jesus Christ and her role in his inner circle. You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting staff writer Kalina Fraga. And I'm All That's Interesting staff writer Austin Harvey. Today, we're untangling the real story of Mary Magdalene. And it all starts almost 2,000 years ago. Mary played a pretty big role in like a lot of stuff in the Bible. She appears in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and she's described in the Bible as one of the women who follow Jesus from place to place alongside the 12 male apostles. According to biblical scholars, just the fact that her name is mentioned means that she was a pretty important part of his inner circle. Right, yeah. This one professor of classics and religious studies, his name is Robert Cargill, said... Mary was named in the Gospels, so she was obviously important. There were apparently hundreds if not thousands of followers of Jesus, but we don't know most of their names, so the fact that she's named is a big deal. That makes sense to me. Mary was also his mother's name. Correct. Right? Yeah. A lot and of there's Marys. actually there's a lot of Marys in the Bible, and that's going to come up in I was gonna say, that's terms of how her framing. The confusion, yeah. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke describes the people following Jesus and says... Uh, with him went the twelve, the twelve apostles, as well as certain women who had been cured of evil spirits and ailments. Mary, surnamed the Magdalene, from whom seven, seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, Susanna, and several others who provided for them out of their own resources. Seven demons inside her at one point. Yeah. That's crazy. And that that is important for a little bit later, but Luke probably meant that she had some kind of physical or psychological ailment that Jesus had right, right. cured. Right. Interestingly, he says that the women provided for the apostles, which suggests that they were women of means who were able to support them. Hmm. Like skilled workers, artisans, tailors, things like that. Something. Yeah. They had the money to contribute to the cause anyway. And Mary seems especially important out of these female followers because she's around for some of the Bible's biggest moments, uh, Jesus's crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. The three big ones. The three big ones. During his final hours alive, Jesus's final hours alive, most of his male followers flee 
because they were more likely to be arrested than women. But Mary and the other female followers stayed with him. She's also the first person to notice that his tomb is empty. The male followers are kind of coming and going, and she's just, like, staying there. Huh. And she's the first person to witness his resurrection. Wow. Yeah. In the Gospel of John, she's just outside the tomb weeping. Then she sees angels. They ask, you know, why is she upset? And then Jesus appears to her. Does she see them, like, <laughs> like the really freaky angel who's like, be not afraid, <laughs> and it's like a spinning ball of eldritch eyeballs? It's like a <laughs> They're just H.P. described as two angels. Monster. <laughs> Two angels in white. So, okay. No. So, okay. Yeah. They toned it down. Not as frightening. T- so, she's, I mean, basically, through all these moments that she's mentioned in the New Testament, she's described as a loyal follower, like the most loyal follower and someone who's really present at like all these important moments. But if you know anything about Mary Magdalene, it's probably that she's a sex worker, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I guess the question then is like, how did that, how is that drawn out of these biblical moments where she seems like just a loyal follower? So this all kind of comes back to this all happens in the Bible. And then hundreds of years later, there is this pope, Pope Gregory the First, And in 591, he gives a series of sermons and he describes Mary Magdalene as a sinful woman. He implies that she was a sex worker and he draws a connection between her seven demons that we mentioned and the mm-hmm. seven deadly sins. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's the first time that someone like the pope was like, she was a sex worker. That idea. Yeah. What year was that? When was? 591. 591. Yeah. So a couple hundred years after these events. Man. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I'm curious, like, what sparked what happened? that? Yeah. Yeah. He was not, he was not, like, come up to this idea by himself. He, there was a theory at the time among scholars that suggested that the Mary who'd been mentioned in these passages we just talked about was the same Mary or the same woman who'd mes- mentioned in other passages. Mm. It kind of drew a connection between them. Ah, hence the, the confusion again with, like, the, are these a bunch of different Marys or is it just... Right. Yeah, exactly. So we talked before just now about the Gospel of Luke, where he describes Mary and the other female followers and her seven demons and all that. Right before that passage, Luke describes another woman, and he says, this woman had a bad name in town who came to see Jesus. She brings ointment, she weeps, she washes away her tears with her hair, and she anoints him. And Jesus tells her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Wow. So the idea is that this woman, who's in the passage right before Mary and the other women are introduced, is the same as Mary, but she's never named, and there isn't a clear connection between these two passages. Yeah, it's a little bit speculative. It's a bit speculative, but the Pope said in one of his sermons, she whom Luke calls a sinful woman, we believe to be the Mary from whom the seven devils were ejected according to Mark. So he's basically just drawing a line between those two passages. Right. It's also confusing because the Gospels often describe a lot of the same events, but in like slightly different ways because they're, you know, different people's perspectives right and might not even be the same people that we think they are right yeah if that if that sentence carried the way i meant for it to there might have been more people who wrote the bible who oh oh i see yeah yeah like there's debate over whether or not you know the people uh matthew john mark blah 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 whether they were the actual guys who wrote the bible or whether it was like a group of people all operating Mm -hmm. under a pen name or whatever it is so and written over a long period of time as well. And multiple translations. And there's just, there's a lot, a lot. That, <laughs> there's a lot yeah, to the Bible. Yeah, there's a lot going on. I mean, so within like the Gospel of Matthew, there's the same event is described about the woman weeping mm-hmm. and ge- meeting Jesus and everything. And the Gospel of John also describes another weeping woman who brings ointment to Jesus. And he describes her as Mary. But this Mary is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Okay. These women are often described as having loose hair, which in like biblical times, I guess, was sort of suggestive and like erotic. Mm. They're described as having bad names, etc. So this means that they were likely sex workers. That's the implication. Right. right. Isn't it crazy how sexuality has changed? Like yeah. Like, it used to be like, oh, your hair is down. That's, I can't handle That's that. That's bad. I know. Or like the ever, you know, the joke of like, like someone showing too much ankle. It's like, oh, geez. Yeah. I know. And now, uh, now all that's gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway, these passages are like a big reason why religious scholars were like, okay, these women and Mary were the same person. But there was other stuff going on, too. Basically, it was kind of actually what you just said is that like gender roles had changed 
in right. biblical times around or the time the new, the new testament was written women had somewhat more of an equal role with men but the by the time it was canonized in the fourth century, that had changed. Mm -hmm. And the Vatican, to this day, one of the reasons why they say there can't be uh, female priests is because Jesus had 12 male apostles. So, like, how could there be a, a female priest? Right. Yeah. Like, at, like, at kind of actively erasing the women from the history of it. Well, yeah. And saying if she's, if someone like Mary Magdalene, who for, seemed like a loyal follower and close with Jesus, is a sex worker, then... The biblical scholar we mentioned before said, by turning Mary Magdalene into a prostitute, then she is not as important. It diminishes her in some way. She couldn't have been a leader because look at what she did for a living. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting because you can see where their argument like comes from. Like they've drawn a line between these passages and everything and that you can see it, but right. it's not explicit. Right. Yet from the moment the Pope was like, that's who she was, that's was pretty much accepted for yeah. hundreds and hundreds of years. Because even the Bible itself is pretty like, oh, she was a loyal follower. She was like very devout. She was there for all these moments. So like the text of it says like, hey, this was a good person who was redeemed, who was holy, who was loyal mm -hmm. and devoted. And then, yeah, for one pope to just be like, actually, she was a whore. And yeah. now right. women can't be priests. Ooh, decided. It's like, yeah. oh, okay. Well, then it gets even more complicated because there are all these gospels that are not recognized by the Catholic Church that were discovered in the 19th century, mm. including the Gospel of Mary. <sighs> Twist. Wow. Yes. It was discovered in 1896 in Egypt. It's not recognized again, but it seems to date to the second century, so it's within the timeline of when these were written. Right. It has passages like this. Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior, that's Jesus, loved you more than all other women. Tell us the words of the Savior that you remember, the things which you know that we don't, because we haven't heard them. And Mary responds, I will teach you about what is hidden from you. So this makes her seem like a much more important person within this dynamic with the male apostles and Jesus and everything. Then in the 20th century, the Gospel of Philip is discovered in Egypt. This is also not recognized, but it makes some interesting claims as well, including that Jesus loved Mary Magdalene more than any of his other disciples. And the text is obscure, so you can't read exactly what it says, but there's it's written that Jesus used to kiss Mary often on her, and the word is, you can't read Conveniently it. Conveniently obscured. People think it's mouth. So he's yeah. kissing her on the mouth, which suggests that Mary was his wife, possibly right. the mother of his children, but probably not a sex worker right wow so that just kind of adds even more insult to injury there right it's like well yeah if she was that yeah. erased from that's what i'm saying biblical this, history this popes out here calling her a prostitute and it's like she's a loving devoted mother who is <laughs> like possibly yeah. you know what i mean that's crazy right his most important disciple and in this very close relationship with him and everything. And in fact, the Catholic Church in 1969 even admitted that the Pope had been, Pope Gregory had been mistaken in saying that she was a sinful woman. Yeah. Imagine being Jesus. You're up in heaven, you hear this Pope <laughs> say that, and you're like, oh, you're not getting in. Yeah. That's, that's not mm -mm. what happened. Mm -mm. That's kind of the wow. story, but it's, I think it's just like when I was reading this, I knew the very basics of the story because like, you know, I went to like Sunday school and stuff as a kid and um, I've seen Jesus Christ Superstar like 12 times. But yeah, it's just that sort of regardless of the church's like apology or admission um, in the 60s, like that's just how she's imagined. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can't erase that. It's so deeply set right. in I mean, culture. like why why we think. Or, you know, not why we think, but why a lot of the time Jesus is depicted as a white guy, because mm. that's just who pushed that narrative. Right. That's just how yeah. he was depicted. But it's like, realistically, probably, no, no definitely wasn't. It was definitely not. Sure. Yeah. Caucasian. But oh, mm -hmm. we, have a, we have an article. We have a couple articles on like what Jesus looked like, mm -hmm. how tall he was. I wrote that one. I remember. <laughs> how tall? Yeah. He's not, not very, very tall. tall. Not, no, very, not tall. very tall. Yeah, okay. No. And it's like. It's, it's never like said in the Bible, Jesus was like five, nine or whatever, but it's uh, it's like they, they looked at things like he's walking past a crowd and this other guy can't see him over the heads of the crowd. Mm. Thus, he must be shorter than, you know, like most or whatever, things right, like that. Right. 
Yeah, he wasn't. Yeah, definitely wasn't taller than most people. He's never described that way or anything. So, right. But, you know, it's like it's all interpretation, really. It's like you look for things like that and there's no explicit uh, descriptions of him. So you have to guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It's not like a screenplay where they were like, Jesus enters. He is (laughs) tall, white, bearded. Uh (laughs) Yeah. It's just very like, okay, well, he was a humble carpenter. Probably had a beard. Most men would have, I think. Well, and it's even like when he was born, we we have another article about that. And it's like, well, there's no date, but it's mentioned that like his father went to some city during the Roman census. And we know when the Roman censuses were. So it was probably like that year. Right. Or like, you know, December 25th. Definitely not December 25th. And things like, you know, in the Bible, like King Herod uh, orders the, the deaths of all the the baby boys under a certain age and mm-hmm. like this is a king who really existed and like how would that fit into this timeline and everything and it's interesting you right. have to like, kind of figure it it's like a puzzle i think it's really interesting that some of these gospels like came so that were found so late like yeah. they're, not, they're not recognized, but still that these things are out there. And it's interesting, interesting that they wouldn't recognize them either. I mean, especially if they can actually date them back. Yeah, but it must be. I mean, how would you even connect something? I don't know. It's interesting, too, because like there is relics like um, it's not the Holy Grail. Maybe it is the Holy Grail. I guess it is the Holy Grail. I mean, the Holy Grail is a thing that like doesn't really that's not in the Bible at all. Right. That was like a common picture of like the King Arthur stories. Exactly. Yeah. And then it was sort of adopted by into Christianity. But, you know, there's like if there could have been a cup at the Last Supper that was like that could be. And the churches that have the Holy Grail, like in Spain and stuff, they're like this. This cup was found in Egypt. It was brought there, you know, from Palestine. It's from the second century or whatever. Like they have Mm -hmm. all these like, you know. It reasons. could be. It could be. Grail. It could be. Yeah. And so I yeah. wonder how you would connect like a document like this from that time. Like, well, what I'm, does it need to prove? I mean, I don't know how they. How did they put the Bible together in the first place? They had a bunch of random collections of writings from different people who all recorded Jesus's chronicles at the same time. I mean, it, it, this feels like you. You've just found more of that. Yeah. So, I mean, like, who's to say it's any more or less, like, fictitious, right? If that's the concern, is this really written by one of his followers or was this, like, a some other person wrote this at some random point in time? It's like, I mean, you could say that about any of the stuff in the Bible. Like, how do we, why do we determine that this one, that's real, but these ones, not real? Yeah, right. It must be a pretty high barrier that you'd have to be like, oh, this is definitely real that or it's just like a they didn't want to bother or they didn't want to acknowledge it because that would mean they'd have to recant some other things yeah the catholic church isn't known for always being very open and honest about its uh behind the scenes activities yeah you know we've come to learn in recent years a lot of scandals um that they've covered it's up behind and... the scenes activities yeah yeah <laughs> 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 yeah i mean yeah you know they haven't i mean but really they really haven't always been forthright about everything um mm-hmm. and the catholic church is one of the i mean up until up until very recently was the most powerful institution in the world yeah still one of the most powerful and like you don't really want to upset the status quo by right. bringing in information that could potentially be controversial even if it's you know more accurate so yeah i don't know i i'd be curious to know what it would take to like canonize documents that are from the right time and mention the same people and right i don't know i'm sure there's like a lot of research into these doc gospels and stuff but i don't don't know much about it except for this kind of surface level stuff but yeah i'd be curious to know yeah i mean you also run into the issue of like we we cycle through these popes and then they can they can make decisions that have like massive repercussions as well yeah so like i mean like you like would look at like what happened with uh, pope gregory the first where it was like he said mary magdalene was a sex worker then for hundreds of years that was just what we thought yeah right exactly 
And then they were eventually like, Ooh, maybe not. Yeah, they said he was mistaken. That's kind of a big deal. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's what I mean. Like, that's a very rare thing. Did you ever read the Da Vinci Code? No. No. You didn't? Wow. I tried. I tried reading Dan Brown books, and I just really don't care for his writing at all. I've seen the movie, though. I've seen, I've seen oh, the okay. Da Vinci Code film. Because I think part of that movie was about Jesus's bloodline and, yeah. and Mary Magdalene. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was going to make a joke about that earlier when we first, when you started talking about it. I was like, oh, somebody told Dan Brown. I was like, I actually, I think that was <laughs> yeah. a plot point already. So I th- I'm pretty sure the Knights Templar were like Templar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or in- involved in the Da Vinci Code as well. I think so. Yeah. We should do an episode about those or about the Knights Templar. Because that is. A- I just wrote an article about them. I think it comes out this week. Oh, really? I have a. Yeah. I don't know if I have any more, but once upon a time, I bought a book about them because I got into Assassin's Creed when it first came out. Oh, are in they? Like 2009. Yeah. Game. Got it. The whole point of the game is that like the Assassins and the Templars are like feuding like factions. Oh. But the, but the Templars are painted as the, as the bad guys. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. That's very interesting. I'm pretty sure in the Da Vinci Code, they're like a secret organization that protects the bloodline. I think so. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. They were, there was an interesting article. I mean, I, we could do podcasts about them, be into that. Yeah. One about them, one about the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. About all these religious organizations and what they were really like. Yeah. If we can think of a way to tie those together, we can f- find a new series out of that, maybe. There we go. I would love to do one on uh, like secret societies, like the Illuminati, Freemasons. That's a good idea. I wonder if it'd be hard to find like information about, you know. Well, we have a post on the site about who invented the Illuminati. Oh, yeah. The I actual think I that. Like, organization. But Adam West something. Yeah. Adam West? Like the actor? <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy who played Batman? <laughs> <laughs> Twist. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah I can't, remember his, I can't remember his last name yeah i mean we, yeah we do have a lot on the site about like the history behind the bible and sort of yeah, the interpretation of like jesus's appearance mm-hmm. and i either and wrote these or edited and, something about like who actually wrote the bible which mm-hmm. is why i brought that up earlier because uh yeah it's interesting it's very interesting i've definitely looked through that article before it is it's like complicated yeah because it like yeah, you'd think it would just be like, oh, it's the guy who, who whose name it is. It's like, it's probably not. It's probably like hundreds of people mm-hmm. all just compiled together. So I, I, once again, seeing that that same kind of theme coming up of like erasure where, you know, everyone involved in this creation of the Bible kind of getting written out of it in a way because you have mm. so many people who contributed to it who we don't know about. Mary Magdalene just straight up being disregarded. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, you know, more is like I imagine this started as sort of like oral stories Mm -hmm. because papyrus doesn't really like it's so rarely lasts. So then I I would think that as time went on and and things changed and people's relationships changed and gender roles developed or whatever, like these oral stories then became more and more uh, political. Well, it's it's fascinating, I think, this stuff, but difficult to untangle sometimes. Right. Well, plus we've written some articles. I wrote one a couple months ago at this point where they like found hidden sections of the Bible behind the writing of a new section of the Bible. Oh, yeah. I like they like erased that. it and then you reused the paper to write a, a translation of it. And in mm. the process, just completely left out like par- whole paragraphs. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I would think just like translating in general, you'd probably lose some nuance. Well, that's what I'm and... saying. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mentioned that earlier. It's like, it's like, yeah, you, you know, this thing gets passed around so much. You translate it a bunch of times from, you know, ancient language to Latin to English to whatever. Mm-hmm. Like a game of telephone. Yeah. But also literally they old. were reusing paper because they didn't have enough new paper. Yeah, right. Yeah, stuff is bound to get lost and changed. Mm -hmm. You think how many times it iterates over the years. Like, that's why I I always, it's always a little bit funny when people cite the Bible as an argument for something. Like, Mm -hmm. let's talk like gay rights, right? And they're like, oh, well, in the Bible, it says this, this, and this. It's like, did it originally? 
You don't know. That's just the version of it that you have maybe says yeah. something. And it's mm-hmm. also interpretation. So it's it's not really a rock solid argument because it's it changes. Well, there's so much to be interpreted, it seems like, in the Bible. Right, right. I mean, I think the Bible is a fascinating document in that, like, there's history there. Mm-hmm. These places and people are often, like, real places and people right. um, who existed um, that are mentioned. But then, yeah, there's also all this other stuff going on. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know, it's just a kind of a fascinating... Embellishment there. I think one of the most interesting moments in history is, like, I think I've mentioned this before, but, like, Christianity was growing and then... The Romans like just couldn't. They just they absorbed it, and then Christianity absorbed them, and now yeah. the Vatican is is the heart of the religion. Right. I think that's such an right. interesting like switch of things. Yeah. How power. it just so rapidly replaced paganism. Yeah, right. I think it's because they were smart about it. Because with paganism, a lot of the time it was like you could very scientifically easily disprove something. It was like, oh, Poseidon controls the oceans. It's like, no, he doesn't. We figured out what really does. But then the Bible kind of avoids all of that. They're never like, Jesus makes it rain. <laughs> I mean, he turns uh, water into wine, things like that. Yeah. But he yeah. was just one guy who could do that. It's not like they're like, everybody can do it. Right. Well, that was the thing is like the Romans were like, we'll accept any religion. And then Christ- Christianity was like, cool, we're the only religion. So like, mm-hmm. take it or leave it. And yeah. I mean, not any religion, but any like gods, they would like kind of pull on other gods and stuff. Right, right. They were like, ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, throw that, add it throw to that the, in our pantheon. The pantheon. Yeah, yeah. Get that in there. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'd love to read more about that transition. I was just about to say the same thing. Yeah, I'm really curious how that happened. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I, I know I've mentioned SPQR on this show before. And it kind of like, it it goes into Christianity, but it's not the main right. part of it. And it kind of like ends as as that's like happening, if I remember correctly. So, I, I, yeah, I'd like to find another book that kind of digs into that a bit more. Yeah. I'm also curious because Eastern religions still very non-Abrahamic, mm-hmm. right? Like even today, like in Japan, I think Shinto is much more common than like Christianity is like a very small subsect of that population. So it's still a very Western idea as well. So, I'm yeah, I'm just curious about how it spreads so much and then how that just kind of like stopped at a certain point there's like all right we got enough of them yeah i mean hey if anybody listening is more of a religious history expert than we are and you want to write in and let us know Maybe a little yeah. bit of information about like who all you the know, really, yeah, who really pushed like Christianity in the Roman Empire and all that stuff. If you want to write in and and share your thoughts or opinions or historical knowledge, you can do so by writing an email to podcast at all that's interesting dot com. You can also call in. The number is nine two nine five two six three zero two nine. Yeah, and obviously, as always, you can visit us on the site all that's interesting dot com. Um, you can join our newsletter. Uh, by going to allitsinteresting.com slash sign up, or you can even become a member at allitsinteresting.com slash membership. And you can follow us on TikTok at Real History Uncovered. You can follow us on Instagram at History Uncovered Podcast, and now on YouTube as well. Cool. Yeah, that's that's good, because TikTok might disappear, it seems. Uh, yeah, with the, yeah, this new legislation that might be so interesting. Into. Yeah. I haven't really been following it too much, but I haven't. I've just seen the headlines about it and I'm personally yeah. not on TikTok. So I was like, well, I'm not really. I've offensive, seen but... mixed things where people are like, oh, t- they're going to ban TikTok. But then other people are like, well, no, it's not going to completely go away. So I don't really know. Um. Anyway, I guess what we have coming up next is History Happy Hour always uh, exciting right and then um teddy roosevelt just in general just all about teddy (laughs) (laughs) um uh, specifically the moment he survived an assassination attempt in 1912 yeah awesome but we're also going to talk about a little bit about like other things he survived just a little bit because he survived a lot of stuff and uh yeah i'm really excited for it that song survivor was written about him obviously yeah is that destiny's child it is destiny's child i'm really excited for that episode because i just psyched and it was really fun to write and he's it's a fun story yeah i am also very excited about that one because uh 
as non interested in most presidents as I am, I I do enjoy Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, he's a he's a good one. Cool. Well, it's always good stuff coming. Yeah, and yeah. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this one, give us a little rating in the in the Spotify app or in the Apple Podcast app or whatever app you use to get your podcast. Give a help the algorithm. Give us a little boost, a little boost in the algo. Yeah, give us a nice five star review. That'd be always we always love to see those. Yeah, I'll take I'll I'll settle for a four star review. So that's fine. <laughs> I won't what about beg. three stars? Do you draw no, the line there? I draw or? the line at three star. Okay, right, cool. I'm not a three star man. Got it. Yeah, no, we do often read the reviews, and it's nice to hear what people think most yeah. of the time. It's yeah. nice, and uh, yeah. And yeah, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Yeah, I'll be back with History Happy Hour in a week. <laughs>